While ISIL fighters continue their brutal struggle to carve an Islamic caliphate out of Syria and Iraq, other fighters who claim inspiration from Islam are on the march in the Middle East, Pakistan and Africa. In Kenya, the Somali group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for an attack that killed at least 50 people in a seaside town. Thousands of refugees are fleeing Pakistan's northern tribal belt as the Pakistani government blasts Taliban sanctuaries following the June 8th attack on Karachi's airport that killed 38 people. And in Hebron on the West Bank, officials affiliated with Hamas have been arrested by Israeli troops after three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped, including one who has joint Israeli-American citizenship. For more on these groups and what they can expect to gain from their acts, I'm joined from Washington, D.C. by Al Jazeera contributor Robert Grenier. In a 27-year career with the CIA, Mr. Grenier served as director of the CIA's counter-terrorist center and as the agency's station chief in Pakistan's, ca station chief in Pakistan's capital, Islamabad. He currently chairs the advisory board for ERG Partners, a firm offering corporate finance and strategic advice in the security and intelligence sectors. Robert, as always, good to have you with us. ISIL, of course, is justifying these slaughters by saying it's trying to build a fundamentalist Muslim state in the Middle East. A number of these other groups make similar claims. But how much of this is rhetoric and how, for fundraising and recruitment, and how much of it is a real statement of purpose? Well, if you're talking about ISIL, this is uh, a real statement of purpose. Uh, it uh, may be instrumental in their ability to attract fighters and also to attract funds, but they actually mean what they say. Uh, that said, I think that the, the scope of what they can realistically achieve in Syria and Iraq is somewhat limited. They're very much on the, on the, uh, the march in Iraq, uh, but it will be very difficult for them to gain any traction outside of the Sunni-dominated areas. Part of the reason they're focusing on Iraq right now is because they have probably just about reached the natural limits of their strength in Syria, at least for the time being. But it's still a lot of land that they've taken already in Syria and, uh, and Iraq. So uh, yes. conceivably, it could be a very significant country if they manage to keep control there. Uh, let's turn over to Al-Shabaab. Uh, you know, we've heard about them and their attacks. Uh, uh, they're based in Somalia. They've been on the rampage in Kenya uh, across the border since last year's Westgate mall attack that killed at least 67 people in the capital of Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, they killed 50 people, most of whom were watching World Cup matches at hotels in a police station uh, this week. And like ISIL, they talk about fundamentalist Islamic rule in Somalia, and they're not happy with how Kenya has fought against them. But now we're seeing travel warnings for people who want to go to Kenya. So this is going to have tremendous consequences on the Kenyans. Oh, absolutely. And uh, again, Shabab very much does want to establish a fundamentalist state in Somalia. They made a great strides in that direction a number of years ago and it's because of the involvement of the African Union and the Kenyan army that they have been driven out of the major cities and have had a, a difficult time in uh, in more recent years and so part of what they're trying to do by shifting the scene of battle if you will to Kenya is to try to put political pressure on the Kenyan government to withdraw its army from Somalia and to give them more scope to uh, go on the offensive once again back at home. Across the continent in Nigeria, Boko Haram uh, gained worldwide notoriety when it kidnapped hundreds of teenage schoolgirls, claimed it would sell them as slaves. Uh, but the fighters of uh, Boko Haram have been relentless ever since. They have killed at least 3,300 uh, people this year, including 22 on Sunday. So they captured the world attention and the world's attention and nothing has happened to them. Well, it, at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the, uh, the Nigerian government uh, to do something about this group. Uh, others, to include the United States, can provide assistance uh, and some particularly lethal assistance uh, to the extent that the U.S. is able to extend drone strikes in support of the Nigerian government. But the only real solution to this problem in Nigeria, as we see elsewhere around the globe, uh, is if and when the government is able to uh, assemble the capacity to deal with this problem on a permanent basis itself. And unless and until they're capable of doing that, there really is no solution. Do you think the Pakistani government is going to be able to do that uh, against the Pakistani Taliban? Because we've seen uh, their ability to strike a whole bunch of brutal attacks since it was created in 2007. Thousands of people have died. Uh, do you think the Pakistani government is finally saying enough is enough after that murderous attack at the airport? Well, with Pakistan, you never know. The, the fact that the army has actually moved forcefully into North Waziristan, which is something that they have resisted doing for many years, I think is a significant step. The army has wanted to do this for several months now. It has taken them that long to convince the civilian 
government in Islamabad that uh, they should be permitted to do this. But I do see some disturbing signs. The fact that they are focusing on the foreign presence in North Waziristan, the fact that most of the casualties of their airstrikes thus far have been foreigners, I think demonstrates that they are concerned about the polit political impact in Pakistan of their killing Pakistanis. But they're going to have to be willing to kill Pakistanis if they are going to actually achieve gains in North Waziristan. So they've made a start, but we'll see just how much staying power they have, particularly after we see a backlash, as we almost certainly will from these militants outside the tribal areas, actually in the urban centers of Pakistan itself. And then we've got this uh, kidnapping of Israeli teenagers. Hamas has denied that they uh, are responsible. Other groups have claimed responsibility. But uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, says that Hamas is responsible. Now, one interesting development here is that the head of the Palestinian Authority has actually condemned the kidnappings, offered to help the Israelis. Hamas is not happy with that. They've called that a poisonous knife in the back of our people. Is there a, a silver lining here that the Palestinian Authority is, is cooperating with the Israelis despite Hamas opposition? Well, I, I think so. And in fact, behind the scenes, what we're seeing is continuing cooperation on the part of the Palestinian security services, dominated by Fatah, not by Hamas. Uh, let, let's be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have been working closely for years now with the Israelis and are continuing to do so now and very much would like to recover these three young men. Um, what I think we see more broadly than that, though, is politics on both sides. Hamas does not want to support Fatah in what it is doing in cooperation with the Israelis. They don't see any political gain for themselves in doing that. And similarly, uh, at this point, we really don't know, I don't believe, who is behind these kidnappings. And the fact that the Israelis are very quick to blame Hamas, I think, has much more to do with politics than it does with counterterrorist reality. Yeah, so many uh, counterterrorism problems around the world. And as you said, if the governments of the countries where it's happening don't take charge, it becomes a little difficult for the U.S. to really be able to be the sheriff of the whole world. Uh, Robert Grenier, is always good to have you on the show. Happy to be here.